This is it. Well, well, I'm excited to be with you this morning, excited to bring the word of the Lord. I'm, I'm Eric. For those of you who we've never met, I'm one of the pastors on staff, so uh, consider this uh, we've met. So it's uh, nice to be with you this morning, but I'm ex- extremely excited about today just because I believe um, today kind of sets some, some things in the atmosphere for our students. Usually this, this time of year, um, our students are headed to Verge Camp. It's our camp we go to um, down in Destin, Florida, and it's not like any camp that you and I went to when we were, we were young. I mean, we stayed in the backwoods somewhere that nobody knows where and got bit by mosquitoes with no AC. Well, we like, for about the same price, we can really spoil our students and uh, give them a trip of a lifetime. They s- usually stay in condos on the beach and we, we have fun and get to meet Jesus. And, uh, but this year, things kind of changed, you know? Things are a little different. We're not going to Florida. So the camp's canceled. But what we are doing is it's called Verge Camp. So this year, instead of having Verge Camp, we're having Verge-ish. So, so Verge-ish starts tomorrow and goes Tuesday and Wednesday nights. And, man, I tell you what, I've, I've been a youth pastor for uh, or was a youth pastor for 16 years, and, and man, I, I have never uh, felt the weight and never felt more like I had a word for this, these students than I do for tomorrow night. And uh, uh, I know, talk with the other speakers, Sam Henson and Scott Silcox, they have just some incredible words. And uh, I, man, it's going to be, it's going to be a life-changing week. We might not be in Florida, but I mean, God moves here. And uh, he is going to encounter our students. And man, I got saved when I was in youth group. And the encounters that I experienced when I was younger, man, shaped my life. And uh, this is going to be a a week where these students get shaped. They find their identity. And uh, just as parents, man, if you don't have your middle and high school students registered, it starts tomorrow. It's not too late. Make sure you go to the Refuge website. Get them signed up. More than anything, uh, they need community. This generation is the most connected generation that has ever been, and they're the most isolated generation. And I believe with everything in me, this COVID is a ploy to even isolate them even more. And uh, man, you can wear masks. I mean, we're going to be cautious, but uh, I read stories of guys like John G. Lake, um, who's a great revivalist in uh, Man, if there was a COVID outbreak in his day, he would say, send me. I have faith. Send me. And this thing can't stand in Jesus' name. And so, um, so we're believing that our students are going to be changed this week in a, in a powerful way and, and uh, at the very least find Christian community. So it's going to be going to be incredible. Um, so um, I just want to thank Pastor Jay for letting me preach today. Ten years ago, he took a chance on me and my wife and uh, let us join the team. And, man, it's been the honor of my, my life, serving with him, learning from him, and gleaning from him. And glad my, my family is here. It's a safe place. And, man, we're taking the community. We're taking the community. So we are going to go to Psalms 145 today. If you have your Bibles, your iPod, your Android, whatever you have today, or it'll be on the screens. But we're, we're continuing in our series, Summer Hits, um, and what an incredible series it's been. Uh, Pastor Jay, Pastor Nathan, and Terry, Pastor Skyler brought some incredible words this summer, and if, if there was uh, an all-time hit list, um, some of these psalms would definitely take the majority of these top ten. Uh, but for me, I was thinking about this. It, this Summer Hits kind of has a double meaning. The Lord knows what he's doing. Doesn't it seem like this summer is hit after hit, like, what's coming next? What's going to happen next week? What's going to be the headlines on the news uh, next month? So, but the answer is God. Amen. The answer is faith, and we stand on He is who He says He is. We stand on He is who He says He is, and we're just full of faith, saying we're going to bring light to the dark. Amen. Amen. If you'll stand, let's read uh, God's Word together, and we're going to read the first 19 verses uh, just because I I believe there's something when we declare this into the atmosphere, and it's just that good. And uh, 
David is writing this to us, and he says, I will exalt you, my king, my God and king, and praise your name forever and ever. I will praise you every day. Yes, I will praise you forever. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. No one can measure his greatness. Let each generation tell its children of your mighty acts. Let them proclaim your power. I will meditate on your majestic and glorious splendor and your wonderful miracles. Your awe-inspiring deeds will be on every tongue. I will proclaim your greatness. Everyone will share the story of your wonderful goodness. They will sing with joy about your righteousness. The Lord is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry and filled with an unfailing love. The Lord is good to everyone. He showers compassion on all his creation. All of your works will thank you, Lord, and your faithful followers will praise you. They will speak to the glory of your kingdom. They will give examples of your power. They will tell, tell about your mighty deeds and about your majestic and, and majesty and glory of your reign. For your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. You rule throughout all generations. The Lord always keeps his promises, and some of you need to grasp that today. He keeps his promises. His promises are yes and amen. He is gracious in all he does. The Lord helps the fallen and lifts, the, lifts those bent beneath their lo loads. The eyes of all look to you in hope. You give them their food as they need it. I don't have to be scared. He supplies me with my daily bread. When you open your hand, you satisfy the hunger and thirst of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in everything he does. He is filled with kindness. The Lord is close to those who call on him. Can I get an amen? amen? Yes, to all who call on him in truth. He grants the desires of those who fear him. Come on, let's repeat this together as we do every week. I will hide this word in my heart that I might not sin against God. This word is life to my body and health to my bones. I will be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. And I am confident of this, that he who's begun a good work in me will complete it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. One of the things uh, my family loves to do is we love to have a fire pit out in the yard. We've recently moved out into the country, and at night the stars are just beautiful, and it's a little cooler. Well, now it's not a little cooler. It's five million degrees outside. <laughs> but when it's not five million degrees outside, man, we, we love to start a fire in our fire pit and just sit around and have some s'mores going, look at the stars, talk as a family. Uh, but the funny thing is, you know, if somebody doesn't tend the fire, it goes out. And and sitting around the campfire, usually it's me. I got to tend the fire. I got to stoke the fire. I got to throw some fuel on the fire. But how many of you know that is so true of our spiritual lives? That, okay, I, I know Jesus now, but now there's a responsibility where I've got to tend the fire. I've got to fan the flame. And uh, David was incredible at this throughout his life. David was good at tending the fire. And here's what I mean by tending the fire. David, when he was a shepherd boy, he loved Jesus with all his heart. He tended the fire. And then when he sat under Saul, he burned more for Jesus than when he was a shepherd boy. His fire was getting bigger. Then when he became king, his fire was even bigger. And then at the end of his days, when he was, he was passing off his legacy to Solomon, his fire was even bigger than it was previous. You know, and I'm, I'm 40 years old. And he, here's what I want so passionately to live out in my life is, is I want to burn more for Jesus when I'm 50 than I do right now. I want to burn, if you're 60, you should want to burn more when you're 70 than you do right now. If you're 70, you should want to burn more when you're 80 than you do right now. And Pastors Bill and Sylvania, this, they're incredible at this. I've known them for 10 years, and I can tell you, yeah. They're, they're infectious, but I can tell you, they burn more for Jesus than when I knew him 10 years ago. And I want to be like that. I want to be like that. I, I want to burn more for Jesus tomorrow than I do today. Because I, I look at my life and things that have, I've battled myself and things that a lot of people battle, and it seems like there's this faith roller coaster ride. Am, am I right that 
that there's highs and then there's lows. Or here's the worst one I hate is when people say, you're so steady. I don't want to stand before Jesus and say, man, I was steady. I want to stand before Jesus and say, man, I burned for you. My fire was getting bigger. As I got to know you, I burned more for you. And that's what I'm talking about is what, what can we do to set our lives on a trajectory of burning more for Jesus tomorrow than we do today? That today is Sunday, and I want to burn more today than I did yesterday. And I think there's, there's three things David did in his life, and he did them incredibly well. And it's three staple things that I believe, if we're going to be done with the roller coaster ride, done with steady at it. And if we're going to be burning people for Jesus, I think we have to do these three things. We must do these three things. And the first one is submit to the fathering of God. Throughout David's life, he submitted to God. And it says in Psalms 103, verse 13, The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. And a father does two things, really. Uh, you bring correction. And, in, and the correction that God brings to my life is really his grace. And I'm thankful he brings correction to my life because I need to stay in these boundaries because it's just like a speed limit. The speed limit is a boundary, but if I go above it, bad things can happen. So I, I need this correction in my life. I have to crave this correction. I need the correction that he brings. And, and, and I'm not saying it's he's spanking me, he's hurting me. No, I'm saying it's this loving, tender correction. In a lot of ways, it's the same way we parent our kids, but even better, even more holy, even more pure, even more righteous. So a father brings correction, but a father also brings love. That his love is totally different than any love we've ever experienced. And what I love about his love is there's nothing I can do to make him love me more. There's nothing I can do to make him love me less. His love looks unlike any other love that's found on this earth. Think about this. This, this is, I, I know we can't fully comprehend in our human mind his love, the love he has for us, but, this, but I try. You know, this is my best effort. This is all I got. So if I had to explain the Father's love, right, it's, it's kind of easy to forgive somebody. It's hard, but it, you can forgive somebody. You can move past it, right? And I feel like God, you know, obviously knows our past, forgives us, and that's, to me, that's kind of on the simple end. You can work towards that. Here's what, here's what blows my mind, right? If, if, uh, if I'm, uh, pa Andrew Draper is sitting on the front row, so I'm going to use him. We hunt together, so I know he won't get mad at me for using him. Um, but let's just say that, that in two hours from now, right when church gets out, I'm going to go to his house. I'm going to steal all his hunting guns, all his bows, you know, the things he's passionate about. Then I'm going to steal his car. On my way out, I'm going to take his dog <laughs> and his lunch. Okay. Do you think he would have a grudge against me right now, even though I haven't done it yet? Yeah, he would have a grudge against me right now. But how, how crazy is it? This is what blows my mind, is that the Lord knows that in my future I'm going to deny him. I'm going to break his heart. I'm going to turn my back on him. I'm not going to do what he wants me to. And he still loves me. The fact that he loves me today proves he'll love me tomorrow. I mean... It just, it just blows my mind the way he loves us. And here, this, this scripture wraps it up. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, John 3, 16. A sacrificial love. And then me trying to, trying to figure out this love again. If you would take your children, think about your children, that you're going to sacrifice your own child turn them over to death for somebody that would turn their back on you, 
somebody that would walk away from you, somebody that would hurt you, and you're going to sacrifice your kid? What a sacrificial love. I mean, it's mind-blowing. But if we're going to submit ourselves to the fathering, just as David did, there's a role of being a son or a daughter. So in the, the, the correction is met with fear that, that it stirs up this holy fear inside of me. The Lord is like a father, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. That correction is met with fear. And man, growing up, uh, I, I would say I was a fairly good kid, but man, I, w- I was mischievous. I loved I loved a good practical joke, even as a kid, and my mom oftentimes was on the receiving end of those, because I feared my dad. He'd take that belt off, and in an instant, <laughs> you know, it was old school, you know, it wasn't today where you have to sit him down in a corner and say, Timmy, I love you, <laughs> you know, it was the belt came off, and he showed me he loved me. <laughs> so, but, but, so, so uh, one time, one time in my mischievous way, uh, let's just say a ketchup grenade went off in the bathroom, uh, and my mom was on the receiving end of that, all over her, all over the wallpaper. Um, I did stuff like that. In high school, I mysteriously, freshman year, ended up with a key to the school that uh, made me super popular the four years of high school. <laughs> um, we had some fun, and then... Uh, you notice, parents, I'm not telling your students how to do it. I'm kind of, you're welcome. <laughs> um, and then, and then the, I grew up in Collinsville, Illinois, and uh, the, the community pool was called Town and Country Pool, and multiple times we would sneak off in the middle of the night, and mysteriously the pool the next day was a different color. Um, so I did stuff like that. I was very mischievous. Good kid, but just did... Played, played some wrong practical jokes. But my freshman year, my dad knew he had to get a hold of me because I was, I was a jokester, um, and I was only um, would put uh, my heart and my mind to stuff that I was really interested in, and for me, that was sports. I would give it everything I have and not so much in schooling. So freshman year, he sits me down and says, Eric, if I catch you drinking or doing drugs or you don't can't maintain a B average, you're done playing basketball. You're done playing sports. You're done racing. It's over. And uh, because of the discipline and correction he brought to my life in my past, I feared him. I knew he was a man of his word. And because of that, I got a B average through high school, you know. I didn't do drugs. I didn't drink. I was straight-laced because I feared my father. And, and, but the one thing I love about it is it's not a scared, like, I got to be scared. This is a holy fear. Like, I fear him because of who he is. He's my king, my savior, my judge. But if correction is met with fear, then love is met with love. Love is met with love. And think about this. We, love is not an instinct. We just don't naturally come out and know how to love. We learn love. We learned from those who first loved us. I learned love because of the way my parents loved me. And I model that. So for us, if we're going to be sons and daughters of God, it should be that I model his love. A love that knows no bounds. Surpasses all understanding. A love that extends easily grace. A love that easily extends mercy. That looks past rights and wrongs. That's not a respecter of persons. A love that knows no bounds. Now here's the beauty of them both. You can't have one without the other. I just can't have fear because fear produces legalism. If I fear him, then I just become legalistic. And then if I love him, I can tend to fall away because there's no consequences, there's no correction in my life. And how many times have we seen great men of God fall? And this is what I love, what we're going to do on the property next door with the house. How many men of God have we seen fall? And they say, I loved him, but I didn't fear him. I loved him, but I didn't fear him. 
And the two go hand in hand. And then what happens is, and, and David was good at this, and I know he stumbled, and he had a huge stumble in his life, but, but the disciple John was incredible at this, that I have to have both. And as I mature in certain areas of my life, love wins over the fear. And it's literally, as I mature in certain areas of my life, it's the love that keeps me holy, that keeps me pure, that keeps me righteous, that there's a heart transformation that begins and you, just, you get to a point where you say, I, man, I can't do that to him. I can't break his heart because he loves me. But two, in the areas that, that I'm immature in in my life, that's where I need the fear of God. So to keep me righteous, to keep me under his protection, under his covering, so if I'm going to submit to the fathering of God, I've got to fear him and I've got to love him. David was incredible at this. And if we're going to burn for Jesus more tomorrow than today, we've got to get exceptionally well at this, church. We've got to fear him and we've got to love him. And we've got to submit to the fathering of God, even when we don't want to. We've got to submit. The second thing we need to do is fill up in the secret place got to submit and we got to fill up. It says in Psalms 145, 5, I will meditate on your majestic and glorious splendor and your wonderful miracles. I think this is key, that when we get alone with God, that I take some time and I just sit there reflecting on who he is. I do that first, reflecting on who he is, and that stirs faith up inside of me. Because he won't change. He is who he says he is. And then in Psalms 27, verse 4, it says, this is David speaking. He says, the one thing I ask of the Lord, the one thing I seek most is to live in the house of the Lord all of my days. The one thing that I seek most. And back then, David had to go to the tabernacle to encounter the presence. But praise the Lord, the veil was torn. And I can encounter his presence in my house, in my car, wherever I go, because he put his spirit inside of me. But David says, the one thing that I seek is his presence. The one thing I need most in my life is his presence. And church, we've got to keep the one thing, the one thing. And one thing I've found out in my life, as hard as it may have been with some areas, I had some pretty important things in my life. That, But once I began to dive into prayer, the Lord began to reprioritize some things. Because how many of you know we all have busy schedules, right? Kids and grandkids and you know, you got your job, and you got to take care of the house, and then the car just broke down. Now the dog just got sick. And, and I think the enemy knows if he can keep us preoccupied, he can be, keep our time busy, he takes away our fruit. He takes away our encounter. He takes away our intimacy. In church, we're actually being robbed. The most important thing we could have is our relationship with him. So I just challenge you today that this has to become the non-negotiable thing in our life. It has to be the one thing. The one thing to where I'll be late to work if I don't have time with him. I'll cancel a meeting. I'll cancel the dinner. I gotta spend time with Jesus. It has to be the one thing. And when we enter into the secret place, the Lord will begin to reprioritize our life. There's, there's some things that I thought were important that I, I would always have in my life. I don't have them anymore, and I don't even care. Because the Lord did a work in me. I encountered something in the secret place. I encountered his presence. You know, one of the things my family loves to do, it's kind of like our family TV show when it's in season, is The Voice. You ever heard of The Voice? Ever heard of The Voice? It's a better version of American Idol. So we love it. We sit there as a family. We try and pick the winner. But let me explain it. So there's, there's four judges, and they're in chairs. And they have their back literally turned to whoever, whoever's coming in to audition. 
the person comes into audition, they can't judge them based on their appearance, their age, or how they look, you know, because how many of you know God's not a respecter of persons? He doesn't care. He just wants you in your heart. And then they turn around, and then the contestants start singing, and they can judge them solely on their voice, the sound that they hear. And if the judge, if they capture the judge's attention and the judge thinks, man, I need to partner with that person, they'll hit their button and turn around. And I believe that's what the Lord does in our secret place. He did it to David. David since spent so much time in the secret place, communing with God, that the Lord hit his button and said, I'm going to bring my lineage through you. And today, church, man, there's so much the Lord wants to do. How come, how come Acts is still the pinnacle of Christianity? How come it's still our golden moment? It should have been the starting point. From faith to faith, from glory to glory, it should have been the starting place. Did Jesus not say, hey, in this new way of ministry, I'm going to put myself inside of you and greater things shall you do? in my name. Acts should have been the starting place. And if we get to a place of prayer, if we get into this secret place, I believe the Lord will start hitting his button and say, I'm going to use you at your workplace today. I'm going to use you at the grocery store. You're going to heal people today on your school campus. I'm telling you, the Lord wants to move. We've got to be in a place of prayer. And here's the incredible thing. Here's how important the prayer closet is to the Lord, the secret place. That Jesus' secret place was literally the Mount of Olives. The last place that Jesus left this earth was the Mount of Olives before he ascended into heaven to sit on his throne. He left from the secret place, from a place of prayer. The place he's returning to to set his feet back on this earth is the Mount of Olives. And I think it's a biblical model of how we should live our days, that I should leave from a place of prayer, and I should return to the place of prayer. And I'm not saying you have to spend hours. I'm saying, man, get to know him. Spend some time with him. Give him five minutes. He just wants you. So if we're going to set ourselves on a trajectory of burning more for Jesus tomorrow than we are today, we've got to submit to the fathering of God. We've got to fill up in the secret place. And lastly, we must overflow through generational legacy. We must overflow through generational legacy. In Psalms 145, verse 4, it says, Let each generation tell its children of your mighty acts. Let them proclaim your power. David was incredible at this. He had the blueprint saved for his son Solomon. He had the kingdom at peace that he could pass off to Solomon. He had wealth and treasures stored up that he could give to Solomon. David got this and did it in exceptionally well. And I'm not saying just your children, although I'm gonna pour, like you, I'm gonna pour everything I have into my children. But I'm 40. I'm gonna pour everything I have into the 30-year-olds, into the 20-year-olds and the teenagers. And hear this, you 50-year-olds, I need you in my life. You 60-year-olds, I need your wisdom. My generation needs you, you 70 and 80 year olds. I need you to grow in my faith. I need you to teach me. I have to learn from your wisdom. That's generational legacy. I had the, my wife and I had the honor of uh, becoming youth pastors in the church we grew up in. And it was a suburb of St. Louis on the Illinois side in Pontoon Beach, Illinois. And uh, I got saved in that church at youth group, got married in that church. My kids were dedicated in that church. It meant a lot to us. But then 
uh, we had a move of God in that church. We went six months, seven days a week. Miracles, healings, freedom, salvation. It was some of the greatest days of my life. I don't want that to be my pinnacle. And when it ended, man, it really grieved my heart. It grieved my heart for the local church. It, it, the longer I'm more removed from it, it grieves my heart even more because, man, I miss experiencing that in a community of believers. I miss experiencing Jesus come that way. I miss encountering him in those ways. I miss seeing the movement, the community being changed. And what really grieves my heart is that there has never been a revival in history that we've been able to hand off to the next generation. I'm, I, I love studying revival. I'm a student of revival. I love studying revivalists and revivals and encounters and awakenings. I love it and I'm hungry for it. What I mean by generational legacy is we need to hand off a move of God to the next generation. We can't keep having every generation start over. I don't want my kids to have to spend their lives praying for an end of abortion. I want that to be my generation's task. I want to see the end of abortion in my generation. And then I want to see the greatest adoption movement ushered in through their generation. I don't want them to spend their lives praying for revival. I want to be able to hand it off and say, encounter more, do more, experience more of him. Our generation needs to be the generation that puts an end to racial reconciliation. Their generation needs to li live in perfect unity through the Holy Spirit. And we need to do it through generational legacy. And I'm passionate for this one because Acts cannot be our pinnacle. Can't be the golden moment. Because the Bible tells me, and if I believe everything that's written in this Bible, and I do, that I go from glory to glory, that I go from faith to faith. And that just tells me that my God is not a lesser than God. He's a greater than God, and he's not coming back for a church that's lesser than. He's coming back for a church that's greater than. And if I want Jesus to come back, I've got to be able to pass it off to the next generation. we got to become people that are passionate for burning, burning for him. And with every head bowed and eyes closed. Just want to remind you this, you can't burn for Jesus unless you've made him your Lord and Savior. Unless you've handed your life to him, your, all your plans, your hopes, your dreams, your family, your life, your very existence, you've given it to him and made him Lord and Savior. And if you haven't done that today, I just want you to raise your hand up. This is the most important thing in our faith. All of heaven stops to celebrate when one person gives their life to Jesus. And you might be at home watching us on a live stream. Today is your day. You can get on your knees and give your life to him. You can burn for Jesus, live for him for the rest of your days. So church, let's do this. Let's all repeat this after me. It's just good to remind ourselves of it. 
Jesus, today I choose to make you king. I choose to make you Lord of my life. I declare you as Savior. God, and I repent for my mistakes and my sins. God, I turn to you, and I will live every day of my life from this point forward, seeking you, covered by your grace, covered by your mercy, and washed by your blood. I love you, Jesus. Amen. Listen, church, if we're going to burn for him, if our latter years are going to be greater than our former years, if tomorrow we're going to be more fiery for Jesus, we have to submit to the fathership of God. We have to fill up in the secret place. And we must, we must overflow through generational legacy. Do it for all those who have come before us. Do it for all those who are coming after us. And do it because it's his heart. It's his heart. And now more than ever, we need this in our world. We need burning people. We need fiery people. This could be the church's finest hour. And I choose to believe that. And I choose to watch. I choose with all faith inside of me that I'm going to watch the generations after me usher in waves of revival that the earth has never seen, usher in moves of God that Acts has never written about. And if you're in here today and you say, hey, I'm getting one of those things right or I'm getting two of those things right, I'm here to say we need to get all three of these right. We've got to submit, we've got to fill up, and we've got to overflow. And if you're in here today and you say, you know what, I'm done with the roller coaster ride. I'm going to change my life from this point forward and put me on a trajectory of burning more for Jesus in my latter years. If that's you today, I just want you to stand. I just want you to stand to your feet. That I'm going from faith to faith. That I choose to burn more today than I did yesterday. That I'll wake up every day of my life and say, today I'm going to tend the flame. Today I'm going to throw fuel on my fire. Today I'm going to burn for Jesus. And with every hands raised, just raise your hands to Jesus. God, today we stand and we raise our hands and we just declare we're desperate for you. God, we declare that we haven't seen enough, God. We haven't experienced enough of you. And it stops today. I choose today to burn more. I choose today to tend the flame. I'm done with the roller coaster ride. I'm going from glory to glory. And God, as we seek, will you encounter us? God, you're what we long for. More of you, your presence, your very existence. We need more of you in our lives. So God, burn in us. Holy Spirit, burn in us. In Jesus' name, amen.